This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc. I'm here today with uh, Charles Foster, who is uh, a fellow at Exeter College at Oxford University, and also uh, a, well, a writer, <laughs> a veterinarian, uh, a lawyer. I mean, a whole bunch of different things. I don't. I have no idea if they have departments at Exeter College, and if they do, I have no idea what department they would put you into. Uh, but you've also written a bunch of books. The two I think we'll focus on today are uh, one called Being a Beast and the other one called uh, Being a, a Human. Uh, but you just have a new book out called uh, Cry of the Wild. You've got one called The Screaming Sky in the Hot Unconscious, Choosing Life, Choosing Death. You've got a novel even called uh, Little Brown Sea, and then this little book on on uh, medical law. Welcome, Charles. It's good to be with you, Greg. Thank you. So maybe maybe I should ask, you know, <laughs> do, do you consider yourself an evolutionary a uh, biologist, a, a, a theologist, a, um, a veterinarian, a, a, a barrister. I mean, th this is one of the more wide-ranging um, background stories <laughs> that, I, that I've encountered in this uh, series of podcasts that I do. So, I mean, I think in many ways you're emblematic of what, what I'm trying to achieve with this podcast. Um, I consider myself an extremely fortunate um, and curious human being. Um, and I'm anxious to know what sort of creatures human beings are. And I've examined that question through a number of lenses, which um, life has kindly handed me over the years. Um, but I, I think that all these books um, are about the same quest. Um, I'm trying to find out what sort of creature humans are. Um, so I'm attached to the Faculty of Law at the University of Oxford. Um, and my search in that faculty is a search for a satisfactory legal anthropology. You know, we tend to do our lawmaking um, without asking the question, who are the proper subjects of the law? Which is why our law is so often unnuanced and comes to some grotesque answers. So uh, I think we need to start with bottom up questions like, what are we? Where are we? What sort of place is this? Um, and go on from our tentative answers to those questions to the big things like um, how can, in the light of that knowledge, we thrive best in this place, being the sort of animals that we are. Um, and yes, I, I have a, a, a varied um, academic background, so I started life as a veterinarian and I did various bits of research in veterinary medicine. So, for example, I worked, I'm trying to devise the best tranquilizer cocktail to put into darts to knock out gazelles with in Saudi Arabia. I worked on the chemotaxis of leeches. I worked on the comparative anatomy of a Himalayan hispid called the uh, Himalayan uh, lagomorph called the hispid hare. Um, and then I moved into the law. Um, and what I was looking at mainly in my uh, practice in the law were questions which related to what are we? Now, these are questions which are posed very acutely in the context of, of lots of medical law questions involving life and death. When, sh when does life start? When is it appropriate to say that life has ended? And so on. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had um, the, the chance to look from the relative uh, leisure of the, the Oxford Ivory Tower at some of these questions, rather than being confounded and confused by the hurly-burly of, of practice at the bar, which is what I did for many years. Well, I, I don't think, well, from, uh, I think you've strayed pretty far from the ivory tower in, in this quest and strayed to places that very few people have, have gone in, in uh, at least among the uh, intellectual urban elite. <laughs> but um, in the book, um, Being a Human, you, you know, you, you talk about the the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, and then, you know, you fast forward over a couple thousand years to the Enlightenment period, beginning with, I guess, Descartes is sort of the paradigmatic figure who, you know, separates mind and, and matter. But, you know, you skipped over uh, a couple thousand years, and it seems like it's it's within those thousand years that the the kind of split that you're interested in analyzing happened, right? This This split between, I guess you know, nomos and, and, and physis, right? I mean, you, you, I think it was an interview you did where you said something like, 
you know, children don't make a distinction between how things work and, and what they mean. And, and presumably the folks in the Paleolithic and Neolithic didn't make that distinction. But, but we make that distinction all the time, right? You know, we, we tend to keep separate our, our scientific mind and then, you know, this, all, all the rest of the, of the non-scientific stuff. And I think part of what you're trying to do is, is bring them back together, and uh, and say maybe we should never have split them apart. But but you know that seemed to be like the origin. Of, I mean, Greek philosophy was was really all about you. You can't you you know what is man? How do we understand man? And uh, what is the meaning of being a man? I think that's true of the of the pre Socratic Greek philosophers. I, I think yeah. those big questions um, became lost. Um, from the, the golden age of Greek philosophy onwards. Um, and I think that the, the, the tendency of uh, Greek philosophy from Plato onwards uh, was to try to represent these huge tectonic um, ontological questions in terms of uh, propositions which were plainly um, too small to deal with them properly. Um, and so... I think I would put a lot of the the blame for um, the, the later catastrophe, which I think is Cartesian dualism, um, at the, the the door of Plato and, and the move which um, the uh, the Athenian Academy made from the pre-Socratic roots. Yeah, I remember when I first read the, the pre-Socratics, and I, I was astonished to see that they shared this this idea that uh, I guess it was sort of an animistic uh, perspective that everything in the natural world had some kind of right spirit in it right some kind of animation or you know animated animating spirit um I mean do you think that 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 is part of our folk psychology and that you know it's something that is suppressed through education or is is I mean is is can we and can we recover it? I mean, it seems like part of what you were trying to do with your various adventures is 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 recover a, a way of understanding the world that is more I guess more natural, right? More inherent in in how we look at. You use this term, um, I think it was anamnesis, and I, I, anamnesis. I guess it's a very common term, but I didn't really I'd never encountered it before, but. It, it, it's really all about some kind of, you know, recovery of of a perspective. That's a platonic word, um, unforgetting. Yeah. And um, the big project is recovering, unforgetting all the things which we have lost sight of, lost knowledge of, lost the ability particularly to experience um, in the course of our journey of the last 45,000 years or so since... Um, we became behaviorally modern humans at the start of the Upper Paleolithic. But you, you ask, um, is this knowledge or this intuition of uh, universal spirit, the universal ensoulment of things, um, part of our folk psychology? Absolutely. Um, uh, that's perhaps a rather unkind or pejorative way of putting it. Um, I, I prefer to say it's uh, a reflection of one of the most fundamental intuitions about the nature, not just of ourselves, but of the rest of the world, um, and therefore of the relationship which should exist between us and the rest of the world. If the world, as Aristotle and most people who followed him, uh, thought the whole world uh, is ensouled, um, then that entails lots of things about um, the way that we should relate to ourselves and to the non-human world and we wouldn't have got into such um, an environmental catastrophe as we're in if we had seen that there was uh, a soul in a plant even if it was a, a soul which was of a very different kind or in Aristotle's language uh, had a much lower status than ours. But, but I mean, it seems like in order to see the, the rest of the world, the natural world, as being ensouled, you, you need a very unique human attribute, which is this theory of mind. And, you know, you talk about theory, theory of mind, at least a lot of scientists would say that that is a, a, a uniquely human attribute, right? So, 
uh, I mean, if if theory of if theory of mind is uniquely human, then this is by you're trying to recover something which is uniquely human. It's not trying to make us more like the animals. It's trying to kind of make us more fully human to to sort of recover this this natural theory. Of mind. I mean, you talk about how children will frequently, you know, role play animals, and you know, I remember as a kid, I would animate stuffed animals all the time right and 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 we kind of we kind of kind of get rid of that or move away from that as we get older um and and in more less scientific cultures it's the shaman who sort of act as ambassadors to to kind of remind us of the permeability of this this boundary but you know there are no animal shamans right so i mean is is this viewing of the world as being ensouled kind of a human attribute that 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 is unique to us that we can cultivate well i think certainly the the attribute which we know as human theory of mind is a specifically human attribute very probably um you know, but but that is a peculiar um, iteration of uh, of the general ability to relate to other things it's the ability which uh, allows me to look at you and pose very specific questions to myself about what you're thinking. And in many ways, that's a much less intimate way of relating to you than I might have if um, I were a child who relied um, not on construction of the words which you are uttering in order to work out um, what's going on in your mind, but um, relied instead on amorphous resonances, uh, the fact that we share some sort of uh, weird field between us, or on a more prosaic level, um, by picking up your nonverbal cues, or the smell of the pheromones which are pouring across the ether as you speak to me. Um, well, I doubt I doubt the pheromones are, are making it through this. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> through this video conference. Certainly, if we were sitting in the same room, they would be, wouldn't they? Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, but w- what we sophisticated adults talk about as theory of mind is probably a rather degraded version uh, of that which uh, less uh, linguistically um, dependent. Um, beings use in order to relate to one another and to the rest of the world. Um, so direct experience is is what we should be after rather than um, a, a cognitivized um, set of conclusions uh, about what another person is thinking. So theory of mind is, a, a, as I see it, a, a specifically adult human uh, way of appreciating uh, what, if we were non-adult humans, we would be able naturally to have. Mm -hmm. Well, I think somewhere you wrote that, um, you know, when you first decided you wanted to try to understand the, what it was like to say, be, be an animal, be a beast, you, you started with book learning and, and you said, this is sort of the doing it backwards, right? You know, you want, you want to start with a more, immediate experience and it actually made me me think of uh folks like like bacon right i mean they they also said that if you want to understand the world you you have to kind of immerse yourself in it and go out in into nature i mean that that seemed like a uh it didn't seem in conflict with the scientific approach it seemed like actually a more more honest scientific approach than one that begins with with theory absolutely um we we cannot separate ourselves from any object which we are examining. Um, that is uh, that is a, a matter of fact, and it happens at all levels of of scientific and philosophical inquiry. Um, we know that on the quantum level, um, the action of fundamental particles is. Uh, affected by the observer. Uh, the observed and the observer on that level are, are part of one of one unity. <laughs> the, the whole business of observing is, is necessarily a, a two-way conversation. Um, that, that, that's what relativity is all about. Um, and it seems to me that, that exactly that principle applies at 
the level of a human looking at the bird that he's studying or the human looking at the rock that he's studying as well um unless we unless we enter into uh, a conversation which allows both the observer and the observed to be changed um our perspective is going to be distorted um, by the fact that we have fallen prey to the delusion that we can be objective. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think, you know, a lot of people would accuse you of, of anthropomorphism, right? I mean, that, that's sort of, you know, going back to this idea of, of theory of mind, I think most scientists would say that our extension of theory of mind to animals and and inanimate objects. This is kind of a bug, not not a feature, right? Yeah. Uh, and and we would and they would say, look, you're being you know anthropomorphic by by trying to you know understand other other animals, right? And there's a barrier there that simply cannot be crossed. Um, you know, in the end of the book, you you, you talk about an encounter you had <laughs> at Oxford somewhere where I, I think that the the scientists who met you they thought you were a little bit nuts. I mean, did 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 you did you get that a lot? Where people thought you were kind of nuts? I mean, very few scientists are going to go and spend time burying themselves underground <laughs> and, and eating worms and, and sniffing dirt and so forth. Yes. Um, so, lots of biologists, in particular, um, think that I'm nuts, and I I would say, although of course I would say this, wouldn't I? That that's because they're locked into. Um, an old creaking superannuated paradigm. Um, and I've often found that my um, biologist colleagues here and elsewhere um, tell a very different story once they um, leave the lab at five o'clock. Um, they, they move out of the lab, they move out of their paradigms and they're um, prepared to consider lots of things which are heresy um, during working working hours. Um, so uh, I think that there's an increasing realization that um, anthropomorphism is not the dirty word that it has long uh, been thought to be. So as Carl Safina, the uh, American biologist puts it, anthropomorphism is a good first guess. Um, it's a good first guess f for a, a number of reasons. F the obvious one is that um, we share all our evolutionary history with the non-human animals that we are um, trying to uh, ex uh, get alongside um, mentally. Uh, we share all our neurological hardware and software. So it'd be strange, uh, much stranger than the contrary, if we could conclude absolutely nothing of, about what, what animals are feeling. Um, and there are other reasons why anthropomorphism is um, probably a good first guess as well, uh, and that is that um, consciousness of some sort, and this may be something that we can talk about in a bit more detail later, seems to me to be a fairly ubiquitous um, phenomenon in the world. So consciousness of some sort, affected, of course, um, by the matter which it inhabits, by the brain which uh, mediates it or permits it in some way um, is something which is possessed by me and by lots of other uh, non-humans and if the consciousness which we which we and let's say a fox both possess is in some sense the same stuff um it would be strange if there was no possibility of of any conversation uh, between us, any any mutual understanding. So, uh, anthropomorphism, good first guess, probably appalling second guess, um, almost certainly a dreadful third guess, but it's a good place to start. So, I, I want to backtrack to when you first decided that you were going to undertake the project that resulted in in, in being a beast. Um, and you know, you made this distinction between yourself and, say, Jay Baker, who wrote the Peregrine. Uh, with book, which which is you know fantastic book, and I think you admire it. Right. And you said that, you know he was he was trying to sort of forget himself in a way, and and I think you know a lot of people who kind of go go wild, right, go off into nature, you know, they're 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 trying to 
distance themselves in, in a way, right? They're, they're often troubled. Um, you, you did this for very, very different reasons. Um, but still did, I mean, did people were, how did people react particularly when you said you were going to bring your son with you? Um, you know, how, how did that work out? What was the kind of feedback that you got when you initially proposed this idea? Well, lots of people said, as we've just discussed, anthropomorphic nonsense. Um, the fact that I was taking my son with me was a, a problem for some people, um, because there are lots of people who evidently think that it's better for children to sit slumped in front of the TV or uh, looking moronically at their phones than doing what almost all human children um, have uh, done for almost all of human history, which is to uh, wander through the wild using their um, sensory receptors. Um, so, uh, so far as the as far as uh, the involvement of children was concerned, um, I, I make no apology at all for that. Um, that they had far more. I got the sense that I got the sense that he he was he was better at it than you. He's far better. Uh, I mean, yeah. Human children are not bipeds until they're about uh, two or three years old. So they're at um, the eye and nose and ear level of of most non-human mammals. Um, they soak up s sensation through the pores which they have on the ground. And going back to the conversation we were having earlier, they have uh, forgotten far less about the w way the world is and the sort of place the world is than we have. Um, and so Tom, the uh, son who came with me for lots of uh, the being a beast trip, um, was my great research tool. He had another superb advantage over me, and that is that he has the great gift of dyslexia. So he doesn't chop the world up into self-referential and self-reverential uh, gobbets of language uh, which bear very little relationship to the um the, the thing which uh, it purports to describe so if tom looks at a tree he sees a tree if i look at a tree i translate the visual images from that tree almost immediately into things which have nothing whatever to do with that tree remembered physiological facts about trees or poems that i've previously read about trees so I, i've never seen a tree because of the, the, this diabolical coalition between um, language and my cognition, uh, Tom, because of this gift of dyslexia, um, is not ruled by that coalition. Um, he uh, uses language in much the same way, I think, as uh, an upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherer. In other words, a normative human being that uses language, namely as a tool. Um, He's not used by language. He's not manipulated by language in anything like the same way as, as I am. So um, that's a very long winded way of saying that uh, trying to get properly alongside my son and see and smell and feel the forest in the uh, way that Tom did was a shortcut to working out how um, a fox or a badger uh, saw and smelt and perceived the forest because I imagine that um, foxes and badgers don't have uh, cognitive and linguistic biases uh, of the sort that I have. Well, I mean, whether you're trying to see the world through the eyes of another species or see it through the eyes of people from a remote culture, which is what the Paleolithic and Neolithic folks are, I mean, it's it's an act of imagination. It's an act of, of empathy in a way. Um, which one do you think is harder? I mean, I think most people would naturally think that it's harder to see the world through the eyes of a, of a fox. But it, it seems like, you know, the Paleolithic and Neolithic folks, I mean, they had presumably at least as much cultural and cognitive baggage or frameworks as, as we do. It's just that they were probably very, very different. You know, they weren't encountering the world the way an animal would encounter the world. They were encountering the world with a whole suite of of symbolic meaning and a whole suite of, of narratives that have been handed down from generation to generation. I mean, which one do you think is harder? Hmm. Well, the preliminary comment is that 
I don't think that Upper Paleolithic hunter-gatherers are outlandishly different from us. So we have spent almost all our evolutionary history uh, as behaviourally modern humans, um, as uh, hunter-gatherers. That's really what we are. If you uh, rip off the suit and scratch the skin of a, of a, a, a Goldman Sachs besuited um, director, you will find a hunter-gatherer um, immediately beneath. And since that's what we really are, um, I don't think it takes all that much to revert to type. Um, but in, uh, in answer directly to your, to your question, um, of course, a, a badger is more different from me than you are from me. Uh, but also, you're a much more sophisticated creature than a badger is. You can lie to me. Um, you can give me you can give me misleading cues. Um, the, the the contents of your head is much more interesting to me than the the uh, contents of a badger's head, but in some ways um, more inaccessible. Um, I can work out something of what a, a badger is feeling from my knowledge of of its neurology, um, and by extrapolations from its behaviour, um, those sorts of calculations are much more difficult uh, in the case of a human, even though I am a human. So um, although otherness of all sorts, whether it's the otherness of Greg or the otherness of a badger, it is always um, pretty inaccessible. It seems to me that the whole, the whole business of of, of the literary project is to explore how accessible or otherwise uh, otherness is, and it's and it's mighty difficult. Um, the, the reason that I undertook this project, really, in being a beast, was uh, not so that I could uh, understand a Welsh wood as a badger would uh, understand it, but um, because it would increase my uh, the strength of my empathy muscles. Um, mm. If I could understand even a tiny little bit about what something is different from me as a badger uh, perceived of the world, perhaps I could have a meaningful conversation with my children and my best friends. Perhaps it would mean that I wasn't locked up forever in the echoing loneliness of my own head. Perhaps I could have a conversation which wasn't at cross purposes, etc., etc., etc. So uh, I, I recommend this project for anyone who doesn't want to feel uh, always echoingly alone. Yeah. And a lot of people would say that, you know, if you want to cultivate your capacity to see otherness, th they would say, you know, invest in, in literature, right? <laughs> <They'd> <laughs> say, you know, re read novels. And that, that's how you can learn about the, the other. Um, I mean, is, is this a complementary way? I mean, should, should for folks who are interested in understanding the other – is this is this sort of a, a complement to literature? Um, is yeah. this a project that you you know would encourage everyone to do? It, it's it's part it's part of the same project of trying to get out of Charles Foster's head, um, trying to see um, if it's possible to occupy the exhilarating worlds of others, um, and both literature and my perhaps bizarre project of zoological method acting uh, are, are both uh, attempts to do that. Um, and the, 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 world of an, the world inside the head of Greg is um, far more interesting to me than uh, the world which is in uh, the most distant cosmos that we can imagine. Um, and uh, anything which can shed light on what's going on there whether it's uh, cross bearings from literature, whether it's uh, the uh, tweet, the twitches of your lips as you're looking in now, is um, it's all grist to the mill in this great project of understanding. And and so I mean, scientists, I, I guess I mean you you discussed when you were training to be a vet, right? How you dissected animals and so forth. And, you know, there are plenty of behavioral ecologists that will go into the field and carefully note what the animals are, are doing. But I think 
the folks who are studying animals from those perspectives, they are, are maintaining this, this barrier, right? They're maintaining this, this distance and this remove this, this analytic gap. Um, is, I mean, do you need to have that gap to, to be a good scientist? I mean, and then, you know, you, 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 you flip on the, the empathy and the role play and then kind of flip it off so you can go back to being, being a quote scientist or, do you, do you think that, you know, all scientists need to blur those boundaries in order to really be good scientists? Uh, I don't, I don't like the expression blur the boundaries. Um, I think that in order to undertake properly the true business of science, um, that is of understanding what the world is like, um, we have to use all the resources available to us. Um, and that involves not only the resources of um, scientific observation and statistical analysis and so on, but also the different sort of attention which are available to us. Um, so the, the two hemispheres of the brain, and this is Ian McGilchrist, um, generate different types of attention. So the left brain um, is... Uh, very good at narrow focused attention on on a particular point it's the sort of uh, attention which a pigeon which is uh, trying to pick up with its beak a particular grain of corn uh, needs to apply but that sort of attention alone uh, won't keep the pigeon alive for very long because without a wider sort of attention the sort of attention which is given by the right hemisphere um, the grain of corn um, in front of the pigeon's beak won't be seen in the big context. And part of the context is that there's a fox waiting to jump on the pigeon from behind the, from behind the bush. Um, so mm -hmm. we need both wide, holistic attention, which um, takes account of the relationship between um, individual things, um, and the, the narrow focused attention. Uh, unless we bring those two together and bring them together in the relationship which they were originally tended to, intended to have, namely the left subservient to the right, rather than the, um, the, the converse, we're not going to get an accurate picture of the way the world is. And, now, and, and, uh, you... and, and it, it, it does seem to me that um, the, the business of science has become depressingly... Um, uh, uh, an almost entirely left brain activity um, in which uh, things are cut up, are uh, wrenched apart from, from their context. Um, and that's something the left brain loves to do. If you, uh, if you disable uh, the, the right hemisphere, you, you see a world which is full of body parts. <laughs> Uh, which don't relate to one another in in the whole which they're uh, meant to occupy. I think you used the term, you know, you said we're all kind of colonialists of of nature, right? You know, we're we're sort of wandering into nature, but we are our goal is to rule it, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know, we rule it without necessarily understanding even what it is mm -hmm. that we're ruling. Mm -hmm. And, and control, of course, and ruling and manipulation are left hemispherical um, activities. The left brain governs the right hand, the grasper. Um, and of course, uh, the left brain also governs our language. The right brain doesn't have language, so it can't um, make the appeals um, which that the, the, the left brain um, uh, has. Um, and so lots of, there are lots of neurological facts which um, taken together uh, make it rather difficult to have the, the view of, of the whole world which we're meant to have and which reflects the reality which is out there. You talked about how at some point in your life you were a, an avid hunter, right? Where you went mm -hmm. and, and killed animals. I mean, hunter is also sort of a, a conqueror of, of nature, but 
the hunter has a more intimate view of of nature, presumably, particularly if the hunter has to, you know, kill right with a knife as opposed to a, a gun. Um, you know, hunter. I mean, did that hunting experience in any way contribute to the the later project? I mean, ninety nine percent of the folks in the UK and and the US, right? They eat their processed meat. You know, comes wrapped in cellophane. Right? They have a very, very little idea of what goes on to kind of get the food to the table. Um, I know that in England, there's this huge debate over, you know, hunting and banning of hunting and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And the folks who are the hunters, they would argue that they are the ones that actually have a better understanding of nature than the urban folks who are, you know, lobbying against, against hunting. Um, how did hunting play a role in your thinking around nature it it played a very important role um the first thing to say though is that looking back at those times i'm now very ashamed that i was involved in the way that i was um and i don't recognize in me the, the sort of person who pulled the trigger on all those animals um but there is no doubt that the relationship between a thoughtful hunter um and his prey is very different and far more intimate than the relationship between that same man and the bird that he's just looking at through binoculars. Um, mm-hmm. There is a peculiar, uh, almost clairvoyant connection, which lots of people have tried to describe. Um, whether that's a connection which is forged by the fact of death, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's an acknowledgement as I pull the trigger that sometime the universe is going to pull the trigger on me and that therefore death is something which both that animal and I share giving us a a sort of bond which um, which doesn't exist between a a mere observer and uh, and the the observed. Um, So that that was an important part of my of my biological education. Um, On a more more basic level of course it meant that i had to learn to crawl like a wolf um that i i learned what it was like to lie for many hours with um the stream coming in through the top of my trousers and out the bottom um it uh, awakened my olfaction and my other senses which normally go unnoticed Um, it switched me sensorily on in ways which I don't think would have otherwise happened. So lots of good bequests, um, but looking back, shameful. Although I got lots from it, I don't think I I can remotely begin to justify the uh, deaths of all those animals um, uh, as a result of the lessons that I learned from them. Now, I think in a way you're kind of like a, a, a shaman and, and you, 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 know, you use this idea of the shaman uh, in, in multiple places. But even in the societies that have shamans, I mean, not everybody's a shaman, right? No. I mean, there, there are certain people whose, whose job it is, right, to be the, the shaman. And, and what, what is their job exactly, right? What is it, can the rest of the community derive some benefit from kind of having these folks who serve as ambassadors to this this other world. I mean, do we all need to be shamans, or or can we kind of delegate this this job, delegate this role uh, to somebody else, kind of like we do with priests? I, I think we all, to some extent, because of our evolutionary heritage, have some shamanic capacity. Uh, that is a capacity to shuttle between this plane of being and other planes of being but that said um in all cultures that we know of shamans are the exception rather than the rule they they typically um, live on the edge of the community physically and they're often separated from the community by uh, traits of various sorts um whether those are psychological traits or physical traits so shamans are often um, people who have some sort of physical disability, and they've undergone um, terrifying ordeals. They have 
typically been metaphorically dismembered and they have metaphorically died and been reborn um, in the process of, of acquiring the, the, the particular skills of, of regular shuttling between this world and, 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 and others, or this plane and others. And when they go to those other worlds, uh, whether those other worlds are perceived as being physically across the wall of the Upper Paleolithic Cave or in some uh, other psychological um, level, they bring back good things for the clan. They bring back uh, knowledge about where the um, caribou are going to be, uh, knowledge of whether the rains are going to fail that year. Um, so yes, they're they're very useful. So I mean, could we it, should we have some kind of role like that? I mean, would it make sense to have, say, you know, at Exeter College or you know King's College or you know Templeton College? We got a designated shaman i mean we could create sh chairs of of uh of, of shaman science i mean how would we is there a way that we can kind of import this this role back into 21st century uk or america well, well i i think that slowly and very tentatively we are doing that but we wouldn't use that sort of language in order to describe what we're doing so there's uh, an increased recognition of the ubiquity and um, importance of other states of consciousness, whether those are uh, exotic um, out-of-body experiences in which you hover over your own body or near-death experiences, or, or just the particular perspective that you get from sitting cross-legged for 20 minutes in the morning and watching your own breath surging in and out of your of your body it's acknowledged increasingly that these are are part of of normative human experience and therefore um access to them or at least acknowledgement of them um is an important part of human thriving and of course this is a, a, an argument for the rehabilitation of religion <laughs> um the the, the the ultimate pierced shaman <laughs> um who died and uh, came back again is is Jesus, um, and there are shamanic elements in most of the other uh, great religions too. But if we if we see religion in our traditional forms as as ways of of getting out of our quotidian ways of being in order to access um, other other modes of consciousness, other modes of being, we'll, we will be participating in, in the shamanic project. I mean, it, it's interesting that although, the, there's, the, although there's controversy about uh, exactly how the neurological data are to be, um, to be construed, we, we appear to be neurologically wired up um, to be able to uh, exist or in or uh, perceive in some way or cope with in some way uh, about 11 different dimensions we normally operate on f four so three spatial dimensions and time so maybe um when we go to um into a, an out of body experience as out of body experience such as i had when i dislocated my shoulder and was given gas in air and hovered over my own body extremely common experience or yeah. whether we or when we go into some um, religious ecstatic experience in which we speak in tongues. Um, but maybe we're accessing level five. Maybe our beloved dead are there waiting for us on level seven or eight. Um, I don't know. But the, the, but the, the general point is that we, we appear to be wired up for much more reality than we normally seem to be satisfied with. I think you used the phrase um, you're describing yourself uh, at one moment in your life as a, a lump of idling software in a box made of, of meat. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, that that's a pretty accurate description of, a, of a big chunks of a, a lot of people's uh, lives. And, and I think at one point you said that, you know, there is within the, um, the you know, the, the accountant, or the barrister capacities that are simply 
going unused. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 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 one, can, so, so what, one, one example of, uh, to illustrate the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made is um, a, a chap called Jack Schwartz. Um, and he insisted that he could see auras around everybody. Um, nonsense, said the scientific establishment. Um, and then he was uh, investigated by a physiologist called John Adams. And uh, Adams found that Jack Schwartz could indeed see a, a infrared radiation. Um, that was interesting. Um, what was even more interesting was that uh, when John Adams tested himself, he found that he could too. So we seem to filter out lots of lots of reality. Um, Aldous Huxley famously talked about our brains as a reducing valve, reducing to a, a manageable dribble, um, this great influx of uh, of, of possible data. Um, uh, I, it seems to me that that's, that's right, uh, but there are ways of uh, opening the reducing valve to some extent to uh, allow more data to, to stream in without us going mad. Um, and if we have more data, we will have a, a better epistemology. We'll, we will know more accurately what sort of place we're in uh, and therefore how to inhabit that place more effectively. Well, we're all of us, aren't we? Um, uncomfortable in this in this world. You know, we're, we're full of neuroses. We don't really feel completely at home here. And that's a strange thing. Um, I suspect it's because um, we don't appreciate the sort of place that this really is. And just a little bit more bandwidth might... Uh, reduce the amount of dissonance between what we intuit ourselves to be and what we really are and um, reduce the dissonance between our perception of the world out there and the 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 intuition that we have about the the, the way that world is and so and, i mean and, and this... religions have various various ways of of slackening the reducing valve so, I mean, I guess you're saying that there's there's sort of a spectrum and at one end there's a kind of alienation that you describe and at the other end there's there's madness, right? And, yeah. and, and there, but, you know, there's a sweet spot in the middle and I think you, you would argue most of us are on the on the, on the shy side and, and maybe yeah. could potentially risk it going a little further in, in the direction that, um, of course, stopping short of madness in the yeah. direction of greater experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've given the example already of mindfulness meditation. Um, that doesn't open up most people to uh, dangerous um, schizoid states, um, but it does bring with it benefits which are widely recognised as improving our ability to thrive um, and slightly more uh, extreme manipulations of one's mind um, may allow us to appropriate even more of the reality which is out there. Well, there may be, so there seem to be pockets of, of awareness of what, what you're describing, but if, if you were to kind of zoom out and look at kind of the, the, the trends that you see people uh, following, I mean, it, it seems like the the tendency uh, uh, to move away from these capacities is is just accelerating right um i mean yes when you think about how people spend most of their time i mean i think we spend 95 percent of our time indoors and then we spend a big chunk of that time kind of you know staring at screens right so i mean is this just narrowing and narrowing and narrowing our, our ex experiential landscape to uh, a point where most of these other sensory experiences are, are just going to atrophy. Yeah, yeah. So we are in we are in thrall to the left hemisphere. <laughs> um, there are various ways of fighting back. Um, one way is to throw away our screens. Um, 
another way is to uh, read George Eliot <laughs> um, instead of um, reading a computer manual. Um, another way is mindfulness and meditation, which should be compulsory in all schools. Um, you know, mindfulness meditation is is a way of of allowing yourself to mean something um, when you use personal pronouns. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. usually when uh, I'm wandering around, um, what I think of my what I think of as Charles Foster is in all sorts of places. There's a bit of him over there. There's a bit of him over there. That bit's thinking about the paper he's got to write tomorrow morning. That bit is thinking about whether his daughter is going to get another detention today. Um, the business of mindfulness meditation is the business of bringing all those disparate parts of Charles Foster together in one place so that um, I can say yes, that is me. And that, that seems to me to be uh, uh, a project which is um, a prerequisite of, of all meaningful conversation, certainly a prerequisite of all morality. I mean, how can I say to my children meaningfully, I love you, and if I've no idea what I means or where I is? Um, so that that process of of collimating all the um, the the diaspora, um, bringing together this archipelago of islands, um, uh, which normally constitute me into one place, uh, is the essential um, attribute for any sort of sincere human utterance, any sort of meaningful human being. How can one talk about being uh, unless you can point to the place where the being is happening? I mean, this, this is a profoundly humanistic project, right? I mean, you, you know, you talk about understanding autonomy, understanding identity and authenticity, understanding otherness. I mean, these, these are generally what we think of as the, you know, the, the domain of the humanities. I mean, do we, getting back to education, how would we, if, how would, we, how should we think about restructuring education so as to cultivate our, our humanity in, in a, in a, in a more, I guess, authentic way right how would we do this um i mean well, you, would this would this well, involve well, structure would it change in parenting change in in kind of primary education change in university education right how would we do this yeah well we do have don't we um a very systematic and bitter war on the humanities um in the in the academy this uh, dangerous defunding of of every discipline which can't be uh, directly monetized. Um, so engineers and accountants are uh, promoted and the, the study of uh, literature and the history of art are regarded as, um, in Margaret Thatcher's words, uh, a luxury. Um, in fact, those things which are described as luxuries are um, some of the best ways of uh, of understanding what it is to be a human being, and I think the real revolution which has to happen is um, not to denigrate engineers or engineering, but to say that um, an engineer is a human being before she is an engineer, um, and. That, that reordering of priorities um, would, in a stroke, uh, sort out lots of the imbalance which we see in modern educational policy. So, so far as parenting is concerned, <laughs> um, we've got to be brutal about all the things which, which uh, disable the operation of that right hemisphere. So I try to be, although I fail, totalitarian with our children about screens. Um, 
lots of people are saying it, um, and it, it is so obviously true that we've got to throw away our screens that um, you become, you, well, I, I feel embarrassed about stating the the, the, the blimmin obvious. Um, we've got to embark on that business of of deciding where the eye is as the prerequisite of 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 all education you can't relate to literature in the way which is going to transform you unless as we've been discussing you know what the eye is which is going to respond tearfully or angrily to the the, the piece of literature which um, if you use it properly uh, will school you in the the crucial art of relationship we need to we need to teach the the principle that relationships are everything um not just human relationships but relationships with um the non-human world we need to say that the relationship between things is um the web and weave of of the cosmos um and that anything which uh, defeats um, that insight, whether it's the atomism of, you know, of, of modern sociology, which inserts that which asserts that everyone is an island unto himself, or whether it's things which lock us up physically in our rooms or on our screens, we've got to we've got to say that. Those things strike at the very heart of, uh, of the way that the universe is meant to be and, and that radical measures are therefore needed to restore relationship to its central place, um, not only in uh, our philosophical understanding of the world, but also um, in relation to our, our personal lives. And in terms of their relationship with, with nature, um, you know, how could we foster a better relationship with the the non-human world? Is there, is there a way to do that with our our children? Well, I I, I think it's very easy. Um, you just got to go out and be in it. Um, I, I don't think there is. I don't think there's uh, any more philosophical an answer I can give than that. Um, Relationship breeds an appetite for relationship. Um, and if we go out into green, we will learn to love green. And we will learn that green is better than the grey of the breeze blocks from which our houses are made. So there also uh, needs to be a part of the compulsory curriculum in which people just go out and lie in a field or climb a tree. Um, if you have had a childhood which uh, is marinated in greenness, not only are you far less likely to suffer from um, ADHD or depression, uh, but you're also far less likely to um, become, when you are an adult, a major trasher of the natural world. Well, Charles, this has been fascinating. I think that your adventures right, in both of these these books are um, fascinating to kind of enjoy remotely as we as you read the book. You know, you can really uh, experience. I guess it would be um, uh, not. I'm trying to think of the word. Um, it's, it's when um, vicariously, right? So I think um, it was enjoyable for me to enjoy it was enjoyable for me to experience vicariously what you were doing uh and in a way reading it is not quite the same thing as doing it but it was inspiring enough to make me want to start doing it so uh, i think probably a bunch of people have read both these books and and thought that maybe they should spend some time right trying to inhabit these different worlds and at least sharpen their awareness of these other types of of experience and hopefully i think if you've done anything you've inspired a bunch of scientists to, to maybe 
think that there's there isn't this trade off between science and empathy, science and uh, more direct experience, but rather if they want to be better scientists, then they have to really um, explore these these other ways of experiencing the world. So, Charles, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, and I look forward to reading your, your next book. Greg, I loved our conversation. Thank you very much. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 